Welcome to the CBA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you in-depth conversations with the brightest minds of defense, security, foreign policy, and international relations. Each week, we delve into the most pressing issues facing our world today. In this first part of a two-part discussion, Stephen Nagy discusses the challenges China poses to the rules-based international order, Canada's role in great power competition as a middle power, as well as the significance of the Indo-Pacific to Canada's economic prosperity. In this episode, Nagy provides analysis of Sino-Japan relations, shedding light on valuable lessons for Canada. This is the Expert Series. Dr. Nagy, it's great to have you on the program again, and thanks for joining me and making time to chat with the CDAI. We have quite a bit of ground to cover today, so why don't we get right into it, maybe with a bit of a scene setter for the discussion. In what specific ways do Xi Jinping's proposed global vision and the post-World War II rules-based order clash in terms of values, norms, and governance structures? What are the key areas of tension and contradiction? I think when we look at... um... China and the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping versus, let's say, Hu Jintao, I think that we've, it, it, it's, it's important to, to understand the continuity in vision, but also the slight differences. Um, I think that the Chinese Communist Party of China has been very consistent, that they see the current international system as not representing Chinese interests or the developing world. They see that um, the norms and values that are um, inculcated into international institutions, such as international law, uh, uh, focusing on human rights or democracy, uh, rule of law, as being uh, somewhat uh, alien to uh, Chinese civilization. And I think um, uh, contradictory to uh, much of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, vision of how development should progress and its um, you know, views about Marxist-Leninism with Chinese characteristics. So um, in short, the vision that the party would like is one where state sovereignty is prioritized, where each country has their own definitions of development or human rights or democracy or rule of law, and that um, the idea of universal values really disappears because universal values really uh, would... Uh, curb the power of the party, curb the power of political leaders in China. And from their standpoint, this would be uh, impact their sovereignty. So when we think about this, I think um, the party has been consistent in 50, 60, 70 years. Um, But Xi Jinping has, I think, enhanced the rhetoric and the determination to um, create a a world order where sovereignty is the primary... um, basis by which uh, states engage with each other and that there's really no um, rules to, to, to um, curb the behavior of states. Can international institutions evolve to accommodate China's aspirations without compromising fundamental principles of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law? What would be the potential trade-offs and risks? Well, this is, the, I think, the contradiction that um, Xi Jinping's China has really demonstrated is that you know, China has worked with the United States, for example, on the Paris Climate Accords, which, you know, put together uh, concrete objectives of where we should be going in terms of climate cooperation. We've seen cooperation on terrorism. We've seen cooperation on financial um, uh, uh, sanctions and uh, regulations against terrorism. So they've been part of the rulemaking process. So I think that on the one hand, they say that we're not part of the rulemaking process and the current system doesn't reflect Chinese values. But on the other hand, they've been uh, one of the benefactors, if not the the most uh, benefited state in in the world. But also they've been part of some key agreements uh, and they're part of international institutions such as the WTO, the World Health Organization. You know, they are one of the the biggest providers of UN peacekeepers. I mean, you know, in some ways they want to have the cake and eat it too. That... um, they say that the current system doesn't reflect their values and their institutions, but on the other hand, again, they are uh, actively involved. Uh, so can it continue to evolve? I believe that it can, but it has to be through dialogue and compromise, and it can't be through uh, economic coercion or a Machiavellian might is right approach to uh, changing the current international system. And the track record of China over the past uh, 10 years uh, quite frankly, has been through coercion, has been through gray zone tactics, hybrid tactics to um, reshape the regional region's uh, security architecture, but also reshape uh, what happens in international t- institutions to 
redefine or try to redefine ideas of human rights and democracy. So uh, the question is, is will and does Beijing um, want to uh, recreate the international system through compromise? Or does it want to do it um, in a subversive way that really undermines current international institutions? What specific lessons can Canada draw from Japan's middle power responses to China and adapt to its own context to build effective and constructive relations? So I think most, more, most importantly is that our political leaders, uh, whether it is a Justin Trudeau or a potential Pierre Bourdieu, um, they need to have a disciplined, nuanced way in how they communicate to China and about China. And when you watch the Japanese leaders, they continue to say to the Chinese leadership, we would like a stable, constructive relationship. Um, when they talk about Taiwan, they talk about peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. They don't talk about China, uh, Taiwan as a nation state. They don't talk about um, independence. Uh, they don't talk about many issues. Um, that doesn't mean they don't do it behind closed doors. So disciplined, nuanced communication at the leadership level is extremely important. Uh, second, the Japanese are uh, fundamentally uh, looking at the relationship with China through the lens of engagement, resilience, and deterrence. There is no future Japanese economy without a Chinese e economy. Uh, last year, there was about 391 billion US dollars of trade between the two countries. It's by and large equal. Um, so they engage in China where they can through things like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, through environmental cooperation. Um, we even have a trilateral free trade agreement on the table in terms of discussions between South Korea, China, and Japan. And as you know, or you may know, um, China and Taiwan have uh, applied to have their application for the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership to be considered. So Japan does not say, uh, no to China, it engages as much as possible. But at the same time, it builds resilience into its economy by building uh, multilateral relationships such as the Japan-EU economic, uh, economic Partnership or the Japan-EU Infrastructure Connectivity Agreement. It has reciprocal access agreements with Australia and the UK. It's trying to expand the TPP. So it's building resilience into its economy so that economic coercion and the China's size can't be used against Japan. And then lastly, invest in deterrence. And the new national security strategy that was launched in December 2022 really um, is talking about strengthening its relationship with the United States, um, <coughs> excuse me, building new and innovative security partnerships with Australia and, and the UK and others, working through many lateral organizations such as uh, the Quad. Uh, and acquiring some counter-strike capability. So this engagement, resilience, and deterrence side, um, based on a leadership that is nuanced and uh, disciplined in terms of the communication, um, allows for Japan to engage. At the same time, uh, it creates uh, disincentives for China to use um, military or economic power to coerce Japan. And I think that these are some, um, it's wisdom, uh, that is really important that I think Canada and Canadian political leaders need to consider as they look to uh, how Japan is managing its relationship with China. How might the non-zero-sum approach advocated in the face of China's expansionist ambitions and ideological differences be implemented? And what concrete steps can be taken to build trust and cooperation? Uh, furthermore, how can Canada adopt a non-zero-sum mindset in its interactions with China? Well, obviously right now, anything about China is is charged with uh, controversy in the Japan, in the Canadian context uh, because of this, the political influence um, allegations and, of course, the threats against Michael Chong's family. Um, so these are very serious issues. Uh, but I think that our short-term play, mid-term play, long-term play may be a little bit different. Our short-term play is to try and find, you know, crosswalks of um, cooperation to build trust. So last year, there was the, the Kuming uh, Montreal Environmental Summit. This created some good dynamics in terms of communication. So I think fostering more of these kinds of regular engagements on softer issues, such as the environment, may be the way to move forward. Uh, I'm a firm believer in educational exchanges, um, and I think that uh, we should... Um, put some funds together to uh, promote 
um, short term or mid term, uh, uh, longer term education exchanges in China to build that expertise, uh, but to build expertise about China within a broader Indo Pacific context. I think only looking at China from China's view forgets that it's part of the Indo Pacific. Um, and then, you know, as we engage uh, in China and try to move away from a zero sum of, of arrangement, we have to do it with like minded, knowledgeable partners. Um, so it, it's, 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 we have to work with Japan, we have to work with South Korea, we have to work with Southeast Asian countries because they have the, mo the deepest experience working with China, balancing economics and the politics. Um, and of course, we have to work with um, the United States and the EU as well. So building strong partnerships. Uh, Desecuritizing the relationship may be uh, also important. Uh, understanding the landmines that exist within the relationship, such as uh, Taiwan, um, but that doesn't mean we don't support peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits as the Japanese and South Koreans and Southeast Asians do. Um, but we move away from these ideas are, um, of Taiwanese independence. So I think that again, when we think about this is build short-term uh, dialogue through soft issues such as the environment, invest in education so we can build more expertise on China, but also China within a broader into Pacific context and then uh, continue to invest in our like-minded partners uh, to uh, build a robust um, a group of countries that share a, a, a diplomatic approach to engaging with China uh, while building resilience into the relationship. And then, of course, this deterrent side is ensuring that um, China doesn't act uh, aggressively in areas that are uh, in Canada's interests. Let's take a look at the Japan-EU Economic Partnership Agreement. So this agreement is a trading partnership, um, but it also is a scientific cooperation partnership where they can engage in joint uh, scientific development. It opens up markets. Um, what it does for J Japan's standpoint is that it ensures that if there are political challenges in the relationship with China, that um, they uh, are... Uh, they can continue to uh, benefit from other relationships, such as trade relations with the EU, making you know economic coercion from China much less, um, I guess, effective. So the more of these relationships Japan has, uh, the better. And what we see is Japan take this kind of layered approach. They have the TPP, right? They have the Reciprocal Access Agreement, or uh, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. They have. Uh, this Japan-EU economic partnership agreement. They have the US-Japan mini trade deal that was negotiated at the end of the Trump administration. These are all different um, levels of, of, uh, of a, a multi-layered or multi-tiered uh, trade approach that ensures that um, Japan can continue to engage with, with China from a position of strength in the trade relationship, but also ensures that they're resilient against economic coercion because they have all these other trading relationships uh, and relationships that are trade uh, creating the norms and institutions that are shaping the broader Indo-Pacific. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you, you know, the, the simple expression, I guess in, in Canada, we'd say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And the Japanese are really diversifying where they put their eggs to ensure that again, the uh, reality of economic coercion doesn't take place or it is, its impact is much less. Are there areas where Canada and Japan can be better partners, especially within the context of this shared goal of working alongside China while also challenging China when it needs to happen? Well, I think some um, some points of, uh, of change in the Japan-Canada uh, uh, relationship um, start really with the six-point joint action plan between Japan and uh, Canada it was announced by Mademoiselle Jolie, our foreign minister, in October 2022. And here it's really stressing the you know, six pillars of where Canada and Japan can cooperate. And that's you know, uh, maritime domain awareness, it's peacekeeping, it's supporting a rules-based order, environmental cooperation, uh, supply chain cooperation. Uh, so I think that this was a good step. And then when the Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy which was announced uh, at the end of the year, um, this puts some more details into the terms of the kinds of cooperation that's occurring between uh, Canada and Japan, but also other regions like Canada and South Korea or Canada and Southeast Asia. 
So uh, where can we see more cooperation? Um, definitely, I think we can see more cooperation on trade advocacy. And uh, trade advocacy is expanding trade so that, um, you know, things like the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership acts as a center of gravity of how trade agreements can move forward in the future and shape the behavior of states if they want to benefit from that trade agreement. Um, in the area of security, Canada doesn't have as many naval vessels as we would like. Uh, and to be frank, I don't see them coming. So is the best solution for Canada to send three or four ships? Probably not. Maybe one ship and also think about how we can send capabilities. And that means perhaps sending some of our um, military men and women to the region to share their expertise. And we have a fast experience working within NATO, working with NORAD that can be leveraged to provide more capability in terms of maritime domain awareness, in terms of sanctions invasions, or perhaps even um, deterrence capabilities. And, and you know, linking the uh, Ukraine theater to the Indo-Pacific theater, you know, Canada has had a big role in training Ukrainians to help defend their state against Russian aggression. And maybe um, this is uh, something that we need to be thinking about how Canada can contribute to um, Taiwan's deterrence to ensure that the, um, the future of Taiwan-China relations is one that's peaceful um, and that if they do reunify, that it's done through um, compromise and, and peaceful means. Uh, perhaps Canada has a role in enhancing deterrence uh, with uh, the Taiwanese as well. So I think this is another area that uh, perhaps they could work with the Japanese to enhance some of the deterrence capabilities uh, of the Taiwanese. Um, we also have diplomatic resources. You know, uh, back in uh, January 2018, we held uh, a summit in Vancouver, where you're based now, uh, to try and think about ways to denuclearize North Korea. We brought together middle powers. We brought together the United States uh, to talk about possibilities. So our diplomatic resources are really, really important. So how can we bring um, uh, Canadians uh, into, uh, can, we can bring Canadian solutions to the region? Um, well, use those diplomatic resources and work with our like-minded partners such as uh, Japan. Um, lastly, and I think really importantly, uh, we need to think about what is our comparative advantage. And Canada's comparative advantages uh, include energy and critical mineral security. And I think we have a big role in working with countries like Japan or South Korea to uh, enhance our critical mineral and energy security role, ensuring that we are providing the kinds of resources that make our friends and allies strong and robust economies uh, so that we can continue to engage with them and benefit from them. And I think this is an area that we've really underdeveloped and we, we've frankly missed the boat. And it's an area that I encourage our um, government to continue to find ways to uh, use those uh, comparative advantages really to be an energy superpower and a critical mineral superpower. Thanks for tuning in to part one of our discussion with Stephen Nagy. Part two of our discussion will dissect the intricacies of Canada's position in the shifting global landscape, especially in light of the challenges posed by China and Russia. The discussion will cover topics ranging from the effects of China's ascent on Western influence to Canada's role as a middle power. That's all for today's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next time.